And next up for our named locations of Chapter 2, we have the Black Cabin. The Black Cabin is actually incredibly close to the Ten Towns. It is the closest out of all of the locations in all of Chapter 2. And we get some good information as to why your players might go there. Your players can overhear the tall tale that there is a cabin, which is sadly not located in the woods. It's a little bit up north of the woods. But people say that the place is haunted. But there is a gnome named Copper who is in Brinchander who actually claims that the place has had magical experiments performed there. That isn't really much of a tall tale because that is 100% true. And we'll be getting to that in a moment. For the quest involved with this location, we have provisions for Marcratus. That gnome named Copper Knobberknocker is in Brinchander and he is in fact a friend of this person named Marcratus. The two used to work together, however Copper had a little bit of a falling out and decided to reside within Brinchander. He will tell you that Marcratus was trying to find a way to bring light and summer back to Icewind Dale. Copper's going to want to check in on his friend, so he's going to go ahead and ask you guys to bring some provisions to him. This is where you're going to, of course, go to the Black Cabin, and then you're going to see what actually happened there, which we'll be getting to once again in a moment. But basically, they kind of double dip with this one. Both the quest and the rumor are tied together. What I'm going to go ahead and say is, what if the Black Cabin doesn't have to be right there? What if the Black Cabin is located anywhere around the Ten Towns? Does it have to be that far north of Lonelywood? Maybe it could be located, I don't know, between Dugan's Hole and Brinchander. Maybe it can be located on the outskirts of Mare Dolden. Maybe it is a little bit farther away from civilization, but it doesn't really matter where it is. The big thing is, what if your players just happen to stumble across it and they see this cabin? I like that idea of... You know, a blizzard just harrowing the party, they're thinking of taking a long rest, and just as they're about to do so, they see a cabin just on the outskirts of their vision, and they go ahead and check it out. Trying to get away from the elements and stumbling into the unknown and feeling that air of mystery all around it can be fascinating. But that is just one of many ways you can get your players into this cabin. It is a great little thing you can just plop anywhere on the map, and it makes sense. So without further ado, let's go ahead and dive right into the map of the Black Cabin. And here we are, the Black Cabin. It states here that this place was actually made before there was the Ten Towns. It was made by a ranger long, long ago. And over the course of all those years, this place has been used as some sort of, you know, a public house or a refuge for people trying to escape the snow. But of course, you know, people just make their way back to the Ten Towns. Six months ago, Marcratus formed a plan to bring Summer back to Icewind Dale. He's building this device that is going to attempt to control the weather. This device is called the Summer Star, and it is in fact actually a mini replica of a device your players will actually interact with later on in the campaign, a Mythalar, which is located in the Nethery City. When Mark Kratos made this and activated it, he unfortunately didn't realize its full potential, and it blew up on him and it killed him. But his spirit still lingers on. Here is the fun and also maybe unfortunate part of this little adventure. Your players have an extremely likely chance of dying as well. But don't go busting out those revivifies yet. Your players will actually be able to survive this encounter. Yes, if they die, then their spirit will linger on. But what's cool is as a spirit, they'll be able to somewhat interact with the world. And most important of all, they can be brought back to life easy peasy. If somebody dies within the black cabin, their spirit will linger on and they get the following abilities. They can fly, but they are currently bound to the cabin. They can only move more than 30 feet away from this place. As a spirit, you can try and interact with the world. You can exert up to five pounds of pressure on anything. Basically, you can shove books around or you can try and, you know, flip something, but not th nothing too strenuous. And as a spirit, you can interact with the other people that died as well, including Marcratus. So you might be thinking, oh, this map looks relatively innocent. How can they die? <laughs> well, actually dying seems relatively easy around here. Your players will be able to see when they approach the cabin that the place is precariously placed on a large cliff. In fact, there is a 120 some odd foot drop located right next to the black cabin. And it is relatively easy to make that fall. In area one, we have an outhouse because once again, Wizards is totally remembering that people go to the bathroom. 
In the outhouse, though, what's really funny about this is that for toilet paper, McCratus used old discarded blueprints and notes that he basically discarded. So pretty cute there. For area two, we have the wooden walkway. It, the place is pretty banged up. It looks pretty, you know, messed up. They can walk up the thing no problem. It's when they go past the door there is when they have an issue that's overlooking the cliff. If more than 150 pounds of weight are exerted on the balcony overlooking the cliff, they must succeed a dexterity saving throw of just 10 in order to not careen down and plummet to their deaths. If they succeed, they jump out of the way, land on the snow, and only take a measly one point of damage. But if they fail, they will fall that 140 feet because they are 20 feet up and, you know, 120 feet from base level and down. Then they're going to take 14 D6 points of damage. And presumably what that means is, one, they're going to fall down, and two, they're going to be, you know, away from the party and more than likely going to bleed out or if they don't have any assistance at all, then just die to the elements. In area three, we have the workshop. In here, your players will be able to find smith tools and tinkerer's tools, which will be useful in a little bit. But other than that, there's really not too much going on here, except there is, in fact, a cute little family of squirrels that is, resides in here. Mind you, if you have players that can talk to animals, these squirrels might be able to say, hey, man, go boom, or maybe something cute. Maybe something to allude to what's going on here. Maybe they say, thing move, thing move. Let them in on the creepy stuff that's going on around this cabin. Maybe make them think that this place is actually haunted. In area four, we have the main room. And it's here where you're going to get a lot of the information about what's going on in the black cabin. When your players walk in, they'll be able to see a charred skeleton who is actually coolly enough has a amulet around their neck implying that it's magical because the body incinerated but not the amulet. And they'll be able to look around and see several other things as well. First off, the charred book. The only thing that will be left of the charred book will be something that says Ether. And they won't be able to understand what this is. But this is actually a book named The Magical Wonders of Netheril. And there is in fact an intact copy at another location in Chapter 2, The Lost Spire of Netheril. But more than likely they won't be able to make that connection unless they carry this book along with them and really, really, you know, try and figure out what this thing is. The skeleton and treasure will tell us that without having to make any sort of role, your players will be able to tell that this is a male body and they will in fact be able to find a cool little treasure, an amulet of health. For those of you that don't know what an amulet of health is, it is an incredibly powerful item. It makes your constitution score 19 when you are tuned to it. And 19 con is huge. In 5th edition, you always treat your con as if you always had it from level 1. And that means if you are a piddly little wizard with only 10 con, your health is going to be incredibly low. But then you wear this thing and your con goes up to 19, then all of a sudden you get to add 4 HP for every single level that you ever had. That is massive. So if your players know this information, then they're probably going to be fighting over this thing because... Free HP is free HP. And for the big item here, we have the Summer Star. It is a six inch diameter gyroscope with a whole bunch of rings around it. And unfortunately, woe behold to the fool that touches this thing. Because whenever someone touches this thing, it radiates out and begins to explode. Everybody within 10 feet of the Summer Star when this thing is activated must make a DC 17 constitution saving throw or take 10d10 plus 35 points of radiant damage. On average, that is 90 points of damage. And it specifically states here, if there's any damage left over after dropping someone down to zero HP, they are incinerated. And what does this mean? That means that even if you succeed on the DC 17 constitution saving throw, that is still gonna be on average 45 points of damage. And more than likely, people are not going to have 45 HP here. If they are, you know, very higher level, then it's, pos it's possible to survive, yeah. But lower level groups that make their way over here are going to be incinerated. But that's fine. Because one, hopefully the majority of your group is not close enough to get caught into this explosion. But on the alternative, if your group is all huddled together and does get caught in this explosion and they all die, Thankfully, we have a backup plan for that, but we'll be getting to that later. So the explosion goes off, presumably at the bare minimum one person died, 
but it could be more, it could be less. What happens? Well, the people that are left alive are left doing all the grunt work, but all the people that have died actually now get to interact with Mark Kratos. And it's there where you can give the exposition dump of why he's here, what is this item, what does it do, what is he trying to do, and how to fix this thing. The unfortunate part here is none of the spirits will be able to actually talk to the players, and none of the spirits will be able to interact with the device in any meaningful way. So this creates the really fun roleplay challenge of you have some dead people at a table, but they can still interact with the party. How do you work with this? Do you banish them and not let them speak at all? Do you have them try to write out in the snow what they're thinking and how to fix the problem? There's a lot of different ways you can run this, but I would strongly recommend that you don't allow your players to metagame in any meaningful fashion. So now you presumably have one or more players dead. How the frick are the people that are living going to solve this issue? Well, there's a four-step list here in which they can try and activate the item, but the thing is, is I'm willing to bet some people are going to freak out that some of her friends are dead, and they're going to freak out that this item just straight up killed someone and probably don't want to touch it. Well, one, you should tell your players that this thing looks completely inert and doesn't look like it's going to blow up or activate again. And you should make that very, very transparent that it doesn't look like it's going to blow up again. And two, you need to tell your players that somehow solving this issue is going to bring them back to life. Because I'm willing to bet there is going to be those groups that do say, Oh man, our friends just died, screw this place, we're out. And not solve the issue. How do you express that solving the issue here is going to bring their friends back? Maybe some divine intervention is in order. Maybe the Morning Lord should whisper to the players that are still alive and say, Bring Summer back. Bring Light back to Icewind Dale and I shall reward you. And maybe keep it vague enough that, you know, the players don't go asking 20 questions. And maybe don't let Lathander actually talk to the players any more than that. But definitely get your players on the path of solving the issue here and bring their friends back. So without further ado, let's go ahead and dive into this four-step issue on how to solve the problem. Step one, identify the item. Your players are going to need a DC-18 Arcana check in order to figure out what the design of this thing is, and they can see that it is designed to control the weather. People that are dead will have Marcratus barking in their ear that what this item is, so they don't need to roll. But the players that are alive, of course, need this, and anybody using the blueprints found in the library has advantage on this check. An Identify spell will also help reveal the information as well. Even with advantage, a DC of 18 on especially Arcana can be very hard to do, considering that there is a lot of groups that don't take Arcana as proficiency, and Intelligence is one of the biggest dump stats for 5th edition. So you are probably going to have to somehow let slip that this thing is in fact a weather controlling device, or maybe they can already have been told this by Copper. Step 2, they need to analyze the problem. The design is flawed, and that's why it blows up. There is two rings surrounding this device. It needs a third. Players have to make a DC-15 inside check in order to understand this. This check is made with advantage if they saw the device malfunction, which, you know, is entirely possible. They, they definitely could have watched this thing blow up from more than 10 feet away and saw that the rings couldn't contain its power, and that's why it blew up. But on the off chance they didn't watch this, maybe they stepped outside while someone touched this thing and it blows up and they rush in and see all their dead friends, then unfortunately there is no advantage. But there should be advantage if the players search around the cabin and find a note. And that note will actually be written by Copper, and Copper will say in that note, hey, this thing requires three rings, dummy. So if they read that, either one, it should just be given to them, or two at the bare minimum advantage and maybe even lowering the DC. Step three, they need to fix the design flaw. Thankfully, scattered around here are Smith and Tinker's tools, and with a DC-15 Arcana check, they can basically fashion this ring that'll go around it. However, this is going to take several hours. So unfortunately, all the dead people are going to be sitting there wallowing in misery while Marcradius is just spouting, Ah, oh, this is bullshit, rah, rah, rah. But, you know, you, but, you know, your players are on a mission to save your other friends, so hopefully they, uh, you know, you just cut to black when they say, oh, we're going to make this ring. Using Tinker's tools gives you advantage on this Arcana check, and once again, if you have one of those groups that is not good with Arcana, 
maybe you give them some other thing. Maybe you say the DC is lowered if they have a background with using a smithy and tinkers tools. Maybe the DC is lowered because your friends are helping them out and you actually have something to work with because you can see the other rings. Step four, activate the item. Once your players have constructed this ring, they can now activate the item. It states here that the players need to be attuned to it. And of course, in fifth edition, attuning to something takes an hour. And after that, they can activate the item. Once they activate this item, they gain the ability to cast Control Weather. Control Weather is an awesome spell. It is an 8th level spell. It takes 10 minutes to cast, but it affects everywhere around you within a 5 mile radius. And what's really cool is this lasts up to 8 hours. So for 8 hours of this miserable campaign, your players have the ability to shape the world around them and avoid the cold. But good things can't last forever. Unfortunately, after your players use this, it ceases to be magical and can no longer be used. For activating the weather and hopefully bringing some sun back to Icewind Dale, Lathander shines down upon them and it gives them the blessing of the Morning Lord. First off, all the players that died are brought back to life, perfectly fine, perfectly healthy, you know, full HP and all that. And two, everyone involved gets the blessing of the Morning Lord which is you gain a temp HP each day at dawn. That is massive. That's It's free HP, but remember, temp HP isn't real HP. It's just a buffer. And that is huge. I'm going to say, though, on the off chance that you have a group where they love giving out temp HP, either someone has the inspiring leader feat, or if you have a shepherd of the druid that loves giving out temp HP, this does kind of overstep on what they do because temp HP can't stack. So what I would suggest is if you are in that niche scenario where you have one of those people that loves giving out temp HP to everyone, then maybe you change up what the Blessing of the Morning Lord does. Maybe in that instance you can make it so that the Blessing of the Morning Lord lets them stave off the effects of cold for 10 minutes at a time, you know, once a day and that recharges daily at dawn. Maybe someone is given the ability to cast a light cantrip. Whatever reward they get, the reward of actually living is a pretty awesome one. And that'll be a great moment where you finally did it, you saved the day, all of your friends are back, you all hug it out, and you got, all get to talk about how you just died or dodged dying and got to bring Sun back to Icewind Dale for a little bit of time, and it's great. But there are several things to note here. One, once the device is activated, Marcradius Spirit can finally rest and thus it says, bye everyone, I'm out, and bamps out of there. And two, once this device is activated, O'Reel is going to be pissed and send some monsters out to kill your player. But we'll be getting to all that in a moment once we go through all the little named locations here. Funnily enough, past all of the device stuff, we have the weak floor here. As we can clearly see, there is a weak floor painted out. If, once again, 150 pounds or more is exerted here, the player must succeed on a DC 15 dexterity saving throw or fall an absurd amount 140 feet and take 14 D6 points of damage, where presumably they're going to either bleed out or suffer from cold and just be far, far away from the party. If they succeed, they are able to catch on to the broken part of the floor and can bring themselves back up with a DC 10 athletics check. While well, another creature can use their action to help and assist them. And if they fail by five or more, meaning that they have to roll a five or lower, then they fall down. In area five, we have the Sweet Berry Summer Wine. There is a whole bunch of wine in here, presumably in a whole bunch of cask. And it sounds delicious, but unfortunately it's currently frozen over. So your players are going to have to somehow thaw this thing out in order to drink it. There is no stats here listed on how heavy the barrels are or how much wine is left. But I would just go ahead and say there's one barrel and the barrel weighs 30 pounds and takes an hour to thaw out. In area 6 we have the laboratory. And in here your players will actually be able to see a very sad sight. There is the remains of a clay figure and anybody that succeeds on a DC 15 Arcana check can note that this thing is a homunculus. It sadly died when Marcadius died. And it's in here as well, where your players will be able to find some of the blueprints, which will help them out in building the gyroscope. Area 7, we have an abandoned bedroom, and it's abandoned, and it's a bedroom, nothing fancy. In Area 8, we have Marcadius' bedroom, and it's in Marcadius' bedroom where they'll be able to find Copper's Note. And this is what I was talking about earlier. 
copper will say here hey you know we need three rings not two and if your players find this note then they can understand how good of a guy copper is that copper didn't want to get in the way of Marcadius and he wanted to just deal with the cold and <laughs> told him hey like I'm telling you but you're particularly rude about dinner I made last night copper is a copper is a sweet individual and there we go that's all the locations of the black cabin so we talked about how to walk through this quest if your players had at least one person survive. But the thing is, is it is entirely in the realm of possibility that literally everyone dies. Either they all get killed by the explosion or they somehow fall down. And that is where the issue lies. They're all spirits and they're all just floating around here. What the heck do they do? Thankfully, if everyone dies or if they're having a really tough time with it, then you can introduce an NPC to help them out a Goliath werebear is going to show up. It states here that this Goliath could be Oyama Nartark, or it could just be any Goliath werebear. The Goliath werebear is essentially here just to check the place out and make sure that nothing evil is going on. And thankfully, if you have a group that is totally dead, everyone's dead, then hopefully, as spirits, they can manipulate the area around them by drawing in the snow or making things collapse over here, you know, manipulating the area as they can they can hopefully direct this werebear in order to solve this issue however if you have players that are alive and they just really suck at <laughs> doing puzzles then you can introduce this npc to help them out in the very least what's cool here is it states that after helping the characters the werebear offers to serve as a guide for the group for seven days though it avoids ten towns so if you, after this, your players are like, screw it, let's go out into the wilderness, they can have a werebear friend alongside them. That's awesome. So as previously stated, O'Reel's going to be pissed that this thing got activated. So what does she do? She is going to immediately send Cold Light Walker and Ice Methods to storm the place and kill the players. We get a recommendation here as well of if the players are higher level, then you add more Cold Light Walkers. And if they have the werebear alongside them, then you add more cold light walkers and ice methods. And you can have that awesome scene of as your players control the weather and all of a sudden they can begin to see the area around them beginning to shift. Then the cold light walkers and the ice methods are storming the place. And this is actually terrifying because whoever is controlling the weather is actually concentrating on it. Meaning that if they are damaged and they lose concentration, bye bye spell. So the weather around them shifting all around and they have to sit there and hunker down and then on the horizon they see these cold light walkers and shining blazingly trying to make their way into the cabin and you can have this cool cabin defense scene where they have to set up all around and make sure that they don't get in but at the same time the ice methods storm the place and they begin to use fog clouds and begin to mess up the vision of the players some really cool stuff i would recommend that you don't be too vindictive in trying to basically snipe the person that has the control weather on them but i would strongly recommend saying hey you're concentrating on this spell and if you lose the concentration then it's gone and hopefully that'll be incentive enough for that player that is concentrating to stay away from the fight and maybe even sit out of this fight entirely Maybe they go ahead and hide in one of the rooms and maybe the group goes and performs a defensive layer around them because the group probably really wants the weather to be nice and sunny for a change. And because this place is old and rickety, you can totally have that to the player's advantage. The players can go ahead and be like, oh, you know, we know for a fact there's a weak floor there or maybe they already activated the weak floor. Maybe they'll try and shove the cold eye walkers down it. Maybe they'll try and lure all the cold eye walkers into the area and proceed to burn the place down who knows this fight can be terrifying because cold light walkers are absolutely terrifying they are constantly blinding everything around them they are hard to hit and once they get into melee combat almost everyone is going to be blinded i like this black cabin quest it's unique it's interesting i love killing the players and actually being like oh it's fine you, you could possibly be resurrected you know that's always a great thing to do because more often than not when you kill your players it's heartbreak and misery but this is one of those times where you can be like, hey, 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 hold up. Don't roll characters just yet. You have a chance at living. You know, I, I like that kind of stuff. I like the idea of half the group getting together and being like, oh, how are we going to interact with the still living people? Maybe we have to like shove this book over. Maybe we have to like write in the snow or, you know, we have to think of something here. 
And all meanwhile, the other half of the party is saying, oh man, all of our friends are dead. It's just you and me now. This sucks. And we gotta, we gotta fix this. You know, you can have some awesome role play stuff with that. And I like the combat encounter afterward. And I like the fact that they can just for even a little bit of time, bring some sunshine and happiness to the area around them. I will say though, while controlling the weather does sound awesome, it does state in the spell it only affects within five miles of the radius. I would strongly recommend that that gets compounded to maybe 20, 30, maybe even 50 miles. Because as of right now, currently where the black cabin is, none of the 10 towns would even get affected by the control weather, sadly. it's The nearest town is around seven miles away. So either one, moving the black cabin closer to some of the 10 towns, or two, making the control weather effect hit a larger part of the area around them can be a great thing. And if they're the ones that control the weather and bring some sunshine to the Icewind Dale for the first time in years, people are going to love that. It's obviously going to be, you know, heartbreak and misery once the sun sets again. Y you know, just giving them hope even for a little bit is enough. And the players can actually even drive that in. They can be like, hey, we brought sun to this place for a little bit of time. We are going to be the ones that bring sunshine back to Icewind Dale again. I like this quest, I like the area, I like the monsters involved, I like the, you know, happy-go-lucky feels that you can have coming out of this quest. And I would strongly recommend pushing this one onto your players. And now we are on to the Cackling Chasm. There's a reason why this place is called the Cackling Chasm, because the denizens there cackle a lot. They are gnolls, and gnolls are terrifying in a pack. However, we'll come to a moment why these gnolls might not be nearly as scary as your players might think. For the hook to get your players to the Cackling Chasm, we actually have a hook involved. Nibira Morskull is a East Haven fisher, and she was currently snagged by these terrible gnolls and taken to their terrible lair. Hunters from East Haven were able to track the gnolls down and found where they are, but they were too afraid to go in. And I don't blame them. If I was just a, you know, a common guy, I wouldn't want to go up against a pack of ravenous gnolls. But that's where your adventurers come in. They could obviously go in and storm the place. For a quest involved here, we have gnoll heads. Trovis, the speaker of Kerconic, all the way up north here, says that, oh, gnolls are a huge issue. I'll go ahead and pay you 10 gold a gnoll head. Which is a pretty big deal because, as we'll get to in a moment... There is a lot of gnolls which your players can totally kill. So we get a tale about a woman being killed and her fishing rod stolen. And we also get a quest for, you know, just getting gold per head. But I want to go more in-depth on the woman. Nibira is actually a grandmother. She's a little bit older. She's got, you know, grandkids. And it was her grandkids' birthday soon. She had a magical fishing rod which was able to magically produce fish. And these fish had magical powers. So if you seed that rumor in that, oh, hey, you know, good old Nibira always catching those delightful fish. And then she ends up and goes missing. That is a real hook right there. Especially if you seed this very early on. If you seed that rumor of good old Nibira who always catches those fish with her magical fishing rod. And they, they hear about this. But then a little while later, they hear the bad news of, oh, poor old Nabir was killed and the fishing rod was stolen. That thing, you know, it could be magical. We have no idea what it actually does, though. That could be a good incentive for your players to go out there because, to my knowledge, this is the first magical fishing rod of any campaign, and I'm willing to bet a lot of people are going to be curious about what a magical fishing rod can do. Now, whether they keep this magical fishing rod or they return it to the family, that's entirely up to the players, of course. Uh, you know, good aligned characters versus more chaotic aligned characters but you know giving them that incentive of oh hey you know there's some magic in this world that you don't know about go ahead and explore it kind of thing that is some excellent stuff so without further ado let's go ahead and dive into the cackling chasm located close to 12 miles away from east haven and located in the middle of the mountains it is a little bit farther away and presumably it's going to take a decent amount of time to get there and here we are the cackling chasm we get some really good info on what's going on here about this knoll tribe that is always on the verge of starvation now on the fact that these knolls sometimes resort to cannibalism because they are being led so terribly and they are constantly dealing with the cold and on their leader Chaiska, who is trying to keep this pack together 
Chaiska is a Nolfang of Yinagu. And what that means is if he kills someone and then a hyena eats the flesh of whoever he killed, that hyena transforms into a Nol. And that is how Nol bands start is the leader kills someone and then hyenas feast and they just grow more and more as long as they have some hyenas around them. Chaiska brought this little warband up to the north thinking that it was going to be plentiful pickings, but this was before they were locked into that internal winter. So now, dealing with the frigid cold and dealing with limited supplies, these gnolls are in for a terrible time and are constantly starving and are weak and they totally hate their leader. Normally in this situation there would be a call for a change of power, but the issue is, is that all the gnolls are quite frankly terrified of Chaiska. They don't want to engage in combat with him because he's just way too strong. But this allows your players the unique roleplay opportunity of interacting with these gnolls in a non-combative way, but dealing with their leader. So let's go ahead and dive into all the locations of this area. In area one, we have the cave mouth. Down the stairs, they'll be able to see a whole bunch of skeletons of humanoids. Really creepy stuff. All of these skulls have a symbol depicted on them, which anybody who can roll a religion check can tell that that is the symbol of Yinagu, a three-headed flail. In area two, we have the feasting cave, and this is where all of the skeletons are. And what they'll be able to see is these bones have been broken into because the gnolls are so hungry, they are sucking the marrow out of bones. And all these bones consist of humanoids and animals that the gnolls have been able to capture. And in fact, some of the bones belong to some of the gnolls which have been used for the cannibalism. If any loud noises happen in here, then the gnolls from area 3 are going to storm in. However, the gnolls do not attack. If the gnolls hear any noises, they're going to look around and they're going to cautiously kind of size up the situation, but they are not going to go in for the kill. The gnolls want people that look like they can actually handle themselves to go in and kill their leader. And you should really express that. Normally, you know, your players come across gnolls and the gnolls attack, but you should express that if the gnolls are looking at them, the gnolls are not necessarily sizing them up, but just looking at them and trying to use their eyeballs to try and direct them toward their leader. In area two as well, we also get a little bit of treasure, but not much. Just a four gold, 14 silver, 21 copper, and a random trinket. Really nothing to, you know, go home about. In area three, we have the Shrine of Yinagu. And the reason why the four gnolls are here is because there is a goat's head that has been placed upon the shrine. And all of these gnolls are contemplating licking the flesh off of the goat's head but they think better of it, or at least are thinking better of it, because that is, of course, a offering to their demon lord. Once again, if the group didn't make any noise and they see these gnolls praying there, then I would strongly recommend that you try and play up the fact that these things look starving, but also they don't look like they're ready for a fight. In Area 4, we have the Frozen Rift, in here, because of the walls, it amplifies all the noise of all the cackling that the gnolls do around here. Along some of the protrusions along the walls, there has been gnolls that have been hung up here, and that is because the leader, Chaiska, is encouraging infighting because one, that keeps the pack off of him, and two, every once in a while, that does provide some food for the other gnolls. As you can tell by the elevation here, this place is scary. If your players fall, then they're going to fall hundreds of feet. And presumably, one, they're going to take a bejesus ton of damage. But two, they're going to be in an area where it'll be super hard for them to get back up to the party. So for the vindictive DMs out here, if combat ensues and the gnolls are dragged in because the group fights the gnolls, then maybe the gnolls run up and just try and shove people down. And it's in this chasm where your players can actually meet Chaiska for the first time. If the players make a loud enough noise, then Chaiska is going to go around to investigate. And when he sees the party, he's going to howl out and command all of the gnolls to come and attack these guys. The gnolls are going to come. They are going to look out and they're going to ring the walls of this area. But they are not going to attack. They are looking and they are praying that their leader is killed by these adventurers. There's a DC 13 insight check to determine if your players are able to understand why they are pausing. Even without the insight check, your players are going to be able to see that all of the gnolls are pausing to their leader's commands and they are just looking around expectantly. And they are just looking at the players and looking back to the leader and you can probably guess that, you know, the gnolls want this guy dead. 
In area five, we have Chaiska's cave. And I know this might be a little confusing for people that uh, are looking at this map. So let me go ahead and show off the dynamic lighting here. That is just an overhang. Your players would be walking along this 30 foot layer and they would be going underneath this overhang right here into Chaiska's lair. Same with the area of six and seven here. In Chaiska's cave, your players can find Chaiska if they didn't generate enough noise. Your players will be able to find a decent amount of gold, nothing too special, but they'll also be able to find the magical fishing rod. The fishing rod itself isn't the magic part. The magic comes from the hook. Uh, any fishing pole will do, but presumably, you know, this fishing rod works perfectly fine. When your players look inside, they'll be able to see that there is a silvered tipped spear that is covered in blood, but Chaiska prefers to attack with his claws and teeth because he's just crazy like that. Once again, if your players make their way inside of this cave and are able to get the jump on him, he'll still try and generate noise and have a whole bunch of gnolls come to him, but the players that are looking outside will be able to see all these gnolls, and they are clearly not coming to their master's call, for help anyway. They, they are just waiting. They, are, they want this guy dead. In Area 6, we have the Sleeping Cave, and this is where the majority of the pack rest, and they are currently huddled together trying to keep each other warm. And it states here that at night, there is 12 gnolls, and during the day, there are 6 gnolls because the other six are out hunting. In Area 7, we have the Storeroom, and in here is where they normally put all of their food. But lo and behold, they've eaten all their food. They just recently ate some poor travelers along the road. In Area 8, we have the Caged Berserker. So, recently, a Chardolin Berserker wandered around in here and basically started attacking them. The gnolls accidentally got this Chardolin Berserker into the cage. Basically, some of the gnolls were running away from the Berserker. The Berserker was chasing after him. The gnoll climbed onto the cage. The, the Berserker ran into the cage. And then one of the gnolls slammed the cage down on him. And the reason why your players might catch in on the fact that he is clearly in here by accident is because he still has a weapon in his hand. The gnolls see that this guy is clearly dangerous and clearly insane, and they don't want to attack him because he looks kind of deadly. So the gnolls are just going to simply let him rot here in the cage, and eventually he's going to you know, pass out, and the gnolls are just going to go in and kill him. If your players get too close to this cage, the Charlin Berserker is going to go ahead and try and grab someone and shank them. And if the players open the cage, then the Charlin Berserker is just going to charge right in and try and kill someone. If you haven't already run the Charlin Berserkers, basically these guys are insane. They are literally insane. So if anybody tries to talk to this guy, he's just going to let out weird grunts and moans. And he is not going to say anything at all. So if your players see this guy is trapped in a cage and he is not responding to anybody's speech at all, hopefully they're smart enough to keep him in the cage. But if they go up to him, then they're going to learn real quick why they should not have tried helping him in the first place. So if your players come here and they're more cautious and they are not willing to kill everyone right there on the spot, then they are going to have basically a whole bunch of gnolls that are just watching them, waiting for them to kill Chaiska. Your players are going to fight Chaiska, and thankfully he's not that terrible of a fight. He does have three attacks, and he does have a decent sized health pool. But if your players work together, they'll be able to handle this guy no problem. Your players come in here, kill Chaiska, get the magical fishing line, and hopefully they can make their way out safe. But what happens if your group comes in here and just starts attacking? Well, the gnolls are going to defend themselves. They're not dumb, you know. They're, immediately there's the four gnolls right there. And if your players just start blasting right away, of course the gnolls are going to defend themselves. Why wouldn't they? So with the four gnolls dealt with in the beginning, that is when things get a lot hairier. Once the party makes their way onto the ledges here, they could theoretically get into more combat. And once again, if more gnolls start coming and they start attacking the gnolls, the gnolls are going to act in self-defense and they are going to go ahead and try and kill the players. Once again, why wouldn't they? You know, either one, they die, or two, they kill someone and that's free food. They are probably going to try and manipulate the battlefield in a way which allows Chaiske to get killed, at which point they may try and, you know, back off or try and parlay to some degree. But they are stupid creatures. They shouldn't be played up as super duper intelligent like. On the other hand, you could have it where if the gnolls do get attacked to any degree, all the gnolls just straight up run out of there and you clearly show off that all the gnolls are running and then Chaiska is going to be pissed that all of his gnolls are abandoning him. Hopefully with that, your players will get the hint that, oh, these gnolls clearly want this guy dead. 
maybe we can work something out. The thing is though, even with Chaiska dead, the gnolls are still theoretically an issue. The gnolls are hungry and the gnolls are going to continue eating people. So you should play that up. If your players come in here and don't kill the gnolls, then later down the line, there should be rumors about, oh, you know, some people are still getting nabbed by gnolls. And then they'll come back to the players being like, oh, we didn't kill all those gnolls, shoot. But without their leader, they will be operating a lot worse. They won't be able to conduct as good of raids and they might begin to starve out a little bit more. So if your players come in here and don't kill any more of the gnolls, then you probably say that over the course of time, the gnoll warband starts dropping as they revert to cannibalism or as they get dumb and get themselves killed. Once your players leave the Crackling Chasm, they'll be greeted by six gnolls who just returned from a hunt. They have in their possession either a mountain goat or a crag cat, and they are of course bringing it to the rest of the tribe to eat. The thing with this is if your players fought the gnolls, then this is just going to be another wave of six gnolls that approaches them. But if they dealt with Chaiska, they could probably, you know, emphasize that the gnolls continue to watch them. And the six gnolls are going to be told by the other gnolls that, hey, you know, leave them alone. They just killed Chaiska. For concluding the quest here, we have a little bit of information about Nibira's family in East Haven. How she had some kids and, of course, she has some grandkids. And it is actually going to be her grandkids' birthday. However, the birthday is kind of, you know, soured by the fact that grandma just died. Uh, so one thing your players could do if they are totally morally good and upright, they're probably going to go ahead and donate the hook uh, to the family again. In which case, if they do, then they are given a measly sum of 50 gold. But if your players decide to not hop in on this and don't want to, you know, throw away a magical item, then they get a pretty sweet rod. The hook of Fisher's Delight lets anyone fish in a pool of water, and every single hour that you spend fishing, you roll a d6. On a 6, that allows you to roll a d20 and you get to find a magical fish. These fish are pretty cool. You can either get a fish which pretty much acts like a good berry, it gives you nourishment for a day, and then, you know, loses its property. You can get a fish which smells awful, but you can chuck it at someone, and if they fail a strength saving throw, they fall prone. That's hilarious. They can find a fish which sings in aquan, which is nice, you know, you have a nice little fish floating around and singing to you. And you can find a fish which gives you 2d10 temp HP. That's awesome. This magical fishing hook does sound cool, but the issue is, is if you run it as written, it actually takes a tremendous amount of time to get the effect to work. You know, you have to roll a 6 on a d6. On average, it's going to take 6 hours to get the effect to kick off. And even when it does kick off, some of these effects only last for 24 hours. And you can only fish up one fish a day. So if you keep this magical item purely as written, I'm willing to bet that some people are going to actually start doing the math and think to themselves, you know, maybe we should just give this thing away. It's not worth our time. The effect's not good enough. It doesn't require attunement, but it just takes up a lot of time out of the adventure. So I suggest if you do want to keep this fishing rod in your adventure, then lower the D6 requirement down. Maybe instead of on a 6, it only is maybe even a 4 up. 50% of the time, they catch a fish. Maybe have it tied to a skill-based event. Maybe just make it where automatically after an hour, they just get the fish. But tailor this to your adventure. If you're running one of those groups where they love spending a tremendous amount of time in-game, you know, hours, days, weeks, months, years on adventures, then go ahead and keep it as is. It's fine. But for the groups that definitely want to keep the ball rolling and keep going, you are going to have to lower that requirement down quite a lot. The Crackling Chasm is a pretty shallow dungeon delve experience. There's really not much going on with it. But, of course, the fact that you can interact with gnolls in a non-hostile way is intriguing. And you can obviously have that roleplay element of your players dealing with Chaiska and then looking around at all these gnolls and they're just like looking about, thinking about what's next. As soon as the players give the gnolls the opportunity, they're just going to go ahead and jump on Chaiska's body and start eating him, which is totally gnarly. But the thing is, is what happens after that? We don't really get too much information on that. There's literally only a single sentence that says, even so, any gnolls they leave remain a potential threat to Ten Towns. So maybe add that to a potential plotline down the line where East Haveners are attacked by these gnolls or travelers are attacked by these gnolls. Maybe do something. There really isn't too much more to say other than, you know, Crackling Chasm is a unique little experience. 
Hopefully none of your players have pushed down the chasm because rolling 20d6 is not fun. For them, anyway. <laughs>